So with that preamble, let me start with a story, and the story of how when our artificial intelligence lab was starting off about two years uh, from now, we were you know, a small group of a dozen people. And we had this grand vision of how we can affect the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And we wanted to do it with a technology that almost none of us had any experience working on. And, and we wanted to do it in a fairly short period of time, about a year. So you know, this kind of sounds like a recipe for a disaster, right? Uh, but luckily for us, um, we were, I would say, quite a bit successful. Um, so the technology, and if you guys have heard my colleague Sanjeev's talk before that we worked on and developed over the course of last year, year and a half, is very, very good uh, speech recognition. And why did we start with speech recognition? Why did we start down this path when we had no experience whatsoever? And one of the reasons is because of really big numbers. Um, the big number that I want to talk about is 600 million. So there are 600 million mobile users in China, which completely dwarfs anything that we have in the US. And we think that we use mobile phones quite a bit in our daily lives. Uh, let me say, wait till you go to China. I went to Beijing for the first time a couple of weeks back, and I was completely blown away how pervasive and ubiquitous mobile phone usage is in China. Um, one example is uh, what I call offline to online, online to offline commerce. It's perfectly natural in Beijing to walk up to a vending machine, hold your phone against a QR code on the vending machine, buy a soda, and pay through your phone. Nobody brings out a credit card in Beijing. I've never seen it. People pay through their phones. Um, this is something that you will never see even in a tech frontier like the Bay Area. But this is completely natural in Beijing. So, we as a company, Baidu, we are one of the biggest internet companies in China, and our mobile properties and websites are used by hundreds of millions of people daily. So we are very, very concerned about, or we want to drive user adoption. And one thing we should keep in mind about the users in China, they're a little bit different from users in the US. For a lot of the 600 million people, this is the first computer that they've ever owned. They've never had a PC. They've completely jumped the PC to go to the phone. So to drive user adoption, we have to make the usage of these phones as natural as possible. So we have to think about how do we humans think, what do we humans think are, is natural? And one thing that we want to do is you want to make the interaction with the phone as if you're interacting with a human. And one way to do that is to use what we are good at, what is our user interface. And our user interface, many user interface that we have uh, is speech. We talk to each other. So you want to be able to talk to the phone like we talk to a um, human. And this comes very naturally to somebody who has never used a computer before. Um, so what are the challenges in this natural user interface? And there, if you want to actually talk to a phone like you talk to a user, there are many aspects of it. So it starts off with speech recognition, which is you take in voice, you output text. Output text. Once you output text, you have to find out what the mood of the user is. And then you have to figure out what does the user really want. And once you have figured those out, you have to figure out what you're going to tell back to the user. What's going to be a reply? And once you have your reply formulated, um, you want to have very, very good text-to-speech, a text-to-speech which has emotional cues, which doesn't sound robotic, which sounds natural. Now, each of these are incredibly hard problems by themselves. And the one problem that we want to tackle was the problem of speech recognition, because it is kind of the first thing in the pipeline. Without that, you can't really do any of the others. Now, if you look at speech recognition, speech recognition has been a very, very well-studied field. It's been studied for many, many decades. There are pipelines like Caldi uh, that work uh, reasonably well. But these pipelines also have some challenges. So one challenge with a Caldi pipeline is a very, very complicated system. It has many stages. Each of these stages are modeled by somebody who knows the domain really, really well. For example, you would have a stage for, say, modeling phonemes, another stage for modeling accents. So you need a lot of domain expertise to create a pipeline like this. 
And while this is, you could say, you know, it's a source of strength that you have these domain experts, you've studied the field, they're doing this, they're doing a good job. And I would say, yeah, it is, they are doing a good job. But the downside of it, it makes these pipelines kind of inflexible and they don't really learn in the presence of big data. So when you have a Kaldi pipeline and you have a lot of data, say from users who have different accents or from different noise backgrounds, if you train this pipeline, because so much, so much of the engineering has been done by humans, they don't really learn from the data that easily. It is also inflexible in a way that, for example, the pipeline was engineered uh, for a particular accent, and now you have data from a different accent. To learn this new accent, you have to hand engineer this feature into the pipeline. Uh, same goes for a different language. Say you have a Kaldi pipeline for English, um, can you use the pipeline for Mandarin, which is a very, very different language, the tonal language? Uh, the answer is sadly no. So you need domain experts for Mandarin to like actually do the whole thing almost from scratch. So we looked at this uh, problem area and we decided, you know, we don't know much about speech recognition at all. We are not domain experts in speech. But what we do have is a lot of data. And we can get a lot of data too. We are, we are good at that. Um, and we're also good at this field of deep neural networks or deep learning. So is there a way to combine these two technologies to create something that is very, very flexible and very, very simple instead of this very complicated pipeline that we have? So with that, we came up with this, uh, what I call our first radical idea, which was, can we use deep neural networks to go end to end? And what I mean by end to end is you take audio from one end into the deep neural network and you emit text. Now, at this point, I should say that the radical idea is not using deep neural nets. The radical idea is really is end-to-end. -end. So people have tried and successfully done, taken a Kaldi pipeline, switched out some of, some of their stages, and put a deep neural net into that stage. So you have kind of a hybrid pipeline. So what is the problem with this approach? And it goes back to, like, can we scale with data? And the answer is not really. So here I have a stylistic graph of showing scalability of data of these three approaches. So at the bottom in the dotted line, you have a traditional ASR, which is kind of a Kaldi pipeline. Um, it, as you see, it doesn't scale with data. And then you have the deep learning version one, where people were doing this hybrid approach. Um, and it scales a little bit, and it flattens. And then we have our end-to-end -end approach in the solid line. And you see that it scales really, really well and continues to scale as we train on more data. So <clears throat> what does this end-to-end -end pipeline actually look like? So let me kind of give you our secret sauce, which is what we call a deep speech two pipeline, which is, uh, we did a paper back in uh, December, uh, which is at that point our state of the art pipeline. So what it does is you have um, audio coming in from one side, uh, and we're doing it for um, say English or any other language, I'll talk about it later on. Um, and the first thing we do is take the audio, we do a spectrogram, a spectrogram is essentially a bunch of FFTs. Uh, this then goes into a convolution stage. We have three convolution stages. And if people are familiar with ImageNet, these are the same kind of convolutions that ImageNet uses, um, except that we are doing in time and um, frequency. And then this data then gets uh, the output of the convolution network, then goes into the uh, recurrent network. Uh, the reason we use recurrent networks is because speech has uh, temporal dependencies. So what I say now, uh, is dependent on what I said five seconds from now and what I said five seconds behind. So you have to somehow capture this temporal dependency in speech. And you do that by using this particular kind of uh, network called a recurrent neural net. And recurrent neural net kind of comes in a couple of different flavors. You have a basic recurrent neural net, so you have a gated recurrent unit, and you have a long short-term memory model. And you play around with all three of those. And you can also go backward and forward in time, and there are challenges in both. Uh, you can have just a forward-only recurrent neural net, which only goes forward in time, or you can have a bidirectional recurrent neural net, which goes forward and backward in time. And it's kind of like having a time machine. And then the output of the uh, recurrent neural net goes into a fully connected layer. Um, what the fully connected layer does is outputs a probability distribution on the character set every 10 milliseconds, so every time slice. It outputs a probability distribution over your character set of 29 characters. This then gets fed into this cost function called a, a CTC cost function, which was invented by Alex Graves. And what CTC does is it takes this probability distribution, finds out the most likely text label from this probability distribution, 
compares it with the ground truth, in which case this is cat, uh, finds out the difference uh, between these two text labels. That becomes the gradient, which is then fed back to the network, and we update the weights, and we do another epoch. We, we take this example back again, feed it, feed it, so on and so forth, like you do um, a neural network training. So you know, it's all well and good. So what are the challenges in, in training like this? Um, so the first challenge that we talked about is we have to get a lot of data. For deep networks to work, data is the key point. Data is the essence for deep networks to work. And I'll get to how much data we need. And once we have the data, um, we have to explore a lot of models because there's not really a theoretical um, framework where we can use to say, oh, you need to have 10 layers and five of them have to be recurrent. I mean, all these number of layers, how they're connected, where they should be, the entire architecture of the network is basically experimental. So you have to run a lot of experiments. And if you have to, have a, have to uh, run a lot of experiments, you want to do them quickly, right? Because you want to get to the solution quickly. So let's look at these two challenges one by one. So how large is large uh, compared to what, um, what is out there? So in this graph, I show you in blue what are the publicly available data sets that you can either buy, actually most of the data sets you have to buy, uh, but they're available. I mean, you can, you, if you have money, you can buy them. Uh, and the data set that we put together for deep speech, which is about 12,000 hours of audio compared to 2,000 hours for Fisher. So there already are six times more uh, than what is publicly available to anybody. And not only that, this is, a, this is a number from last December. So for our data sets, we are very aggressive about collecting more data. So this number has increased quite a bit. Um, and not only that, uh, we can increase this number even more by synthesizing input. By that, uh, I mean you can take noise. So we have a lot of examples of noise. And you, you mix noise with your input data to even go from uh, 12,000 hours to 100,000 hours effective of um, the training data. So that's, um, that's the difference in scale of what is available outside and what we train on. So the next stage, as, um, as I said, once we have the data set, um, we have to train a lot of models quickly because you have what I call a model landscape, and it's a vast landscape. And you have to explore the model landscape as quickly as you possibly can. Um, so to do that, um, uh, we have to get on what is what I call the idea cycle. So the idea cycle looks like this. You have an idea, you write code, or you change parameters in your framework, you look at your training curve, and you decide whether this is a good idea or a bad idea, right? Uh, so why is this, I mean, this sounds super simple, I and mean, why is this hard? Uh, to give you an idea of how uh, complicated this process is, one run through that cycle back in December for 12,000 hours of audio is 20 exaflops. 20 exaflops, that's 20 followed by 18 zeros. I mean, I don't think I've ever worked on a problem which needs 20 exaflops to train. So, and you want to do the training in about somewhere between one to two weeks. Like, at 10 days is what we're shooting for. So if you want to train 20 exaflops in 10 weeks, um, that is a huge challenge. So how do we uh, solve this challenge? So at this time, we had the second radical idea is to rethink how we do deep learning training. So the second radical idea was pose deep learning training as a high performance compute problem. The high performance computing is a little bit different how, from how traditional machine learning is done. The traditional machine learning you do on frameworks like Spark or Kadoop, something like that. None of these frameworks can deal with computational workloads like this. So we have to completely rethink our mental model of what training has to be. And thinking in this way, we have developed quite possibly the fastest deep learning training system in the world. And I'll go into what are the different components of this deep learning training system is. It's completely built in-house. Um, so the first thing that we have to think about is like, why did we even decide to do it? Um, if you look at even deep learning frameworks, you have um, TensorFlow now, there's Cafe, there's Storch, there's Ciano. Uh, when, when we started a year and a half back, there was no TensorFlow, but definitely there was the other ones. Um, unfortunately, none of the others can even come close to handling this much of compute. So we had to build our own. So what are the two basic components of this um, the training pipeline? So at the very bottom, we have a very, very high performance linear algebra library. And this linear algebra library is distributed, which means it can work on different nodes, many, many uh, graphics processing units. 
um, and on top of this uh, distributed linear algebra library, which we call Majel after Majel Roddenberry, uh, we have a deep learning framework that is efficient for recurrent neural nets because that's what we've trained. Um, and we train exclusively on GPUs or graphics processing units for computational efficiency. We can train on CPUs because they just don't have uh, the flops that we need to train on. So typically our training runs, um, tra we tra our training runs use about 32 to 64 GPUs. Uh, we can go all the way up to 256 GPUs, but I'll go into some of the problems that we face going up to 256 GPUs on the issues with scalability. And the other interesting thing we do compared to a lot of the distributed deep learning frameworks is we use synchronous communication. This is very different from an asynchronous communication that you use in parameter servers that Google had pioneered over the, over the years. And the reason we use synchronous communication is because we want repeatability, which means you train the same model and the same amount of same data, you don't change anything, you should gain the same exact result. And if you don't, then you have a bug. We, we don't know any other way of debugging these networks. Uh, if you have a bug in your system, neural networks are really, really good to work around the bug. I mean, they're really good. Uh, so the only way you can do it is by having repeatability. And synchronous communication allows you to do that, but why don't people use it? People don't use it because synchronous communication means that you have to have a really, really efficient communication layer. So we built a communication layer in-house based on MPI. And this communication layer uses MPI, very, very low level MPI primitives um, to build MPI-like system um, that can scale all the way up to 256 GPUs. And for our use case, it's 15 to 20 times faster than anything that you'll get like OpenMPI or any other OpenMPI uh, that you can download and use. Uh, so we've paid very careful attention to the algorithms and our cluster design to do it. So at this point, I should tell you what are the problems with scaling up to 256 GPUs. So if you do what is called weak scaling, which means as you increase the number of GPUs, you increase the mini batch size, you're gonna reach a point where your convergence will suffer. So typically, about 1024, G 1024 uh, mini batch is where we see uh, our convergence suffering. So if you have to keep a mini batch of 1024, and yet be efficient on the number of GPUs, you cannot go beyond usually 32 GPUs because the way the data, the GPUs love a lot of data. So if you have, so if you have 1024 mini batch of 32 GPUs, you have mini batch of 32 per GPU. And below that, you kind of fall into the regime where it's just not efficient for the GPU. So if you want to scale up the number of GPUs, now you're scaling up the mini batch, your convergence suffers. So even though our communication layer can go all the way up to 256 GPUs, we um, usually train around 32 or, or 64 at the max. Okay, so the other thing that we do is our entire training pipeline runs on the GPU. There is no CPU involvement anywhere. Um, this is not that hard because you have um, matrix matrix multiply libraries now that are very efficient on GPUs. You have convolution libraries now that are very efficient on GPUs. What you don't have or you didn't have until January was a very good implementation of the CTC cost function on the GPU. Uh, when we started, CTC is a very, very complicated cost function. And when we started, the uh, people thought that it is impossible to do a very efficient uh, implementation of CTC cost function on the GPU because the algorithm looked really serial. Uh, it turns out people were wrong. Uh, you could have a very, implement, very good parallel algorithm for doing the same cost, and we did it. Um, and it's 400 times faster than the existing CTC implementations on the CPU. Uh, and this project is actually open source. Other companies are using it for doing their, their speech recognition. It, uh, we, it has a Torch interface, so if you use Torch, you can use it. Um, it's called Warp CTC. If you're interested in speech and use CTC, you would, I would highly encourage you to go and check it out. Um, and finally, we also wrote a, a custom memory allocator, and we did it because our memory allocations, we kind of know the sizes of our memory allocations because we know the sizes of our matrices. Uh, it turns out that system memory allocators, both for the GPU and CPU, are kind of tuned for a wide variety of sizes, and those are not the sizes we use. For example, our memory allocations are not usually very small because networks are really big. So we wrote a custom memory allocator for the CPU and the GPU, and the beauty of it is if the GPU runs out of memory, the allocator will transparently move data to the CPU. The user doesn't even have to bother about GPU running out of mem memory, so to speak. And not only that, it's about three times faster than any memory allocator for those particular sizes. So it was a big uh, boost in our training. 
So you know, now we have, have the system architected. Oh, and I should also talk about our cluster. So our cluster um, has, um, each node in our cluster has eight GPUs each. So it is a very, very high compute dense cluster. Each of these nodes in this cluster are connected through an infinite band network for the bandwidth and the latency requirements. And we connect through a, um, a fat tree topology. What that means is the hop from going one GPU in the cluster to any other GPU in the cluster, um, you really only have to go through two levels of switches at most. So this is this um, very close connection between our software system and our hardware system. So it's the hardware software co-design is what makes our system so fast. So without this kind of a cluster and this kind of a network, our communication layer, for example, will not be that fast. So this is how we kind of did the co-design, and this is why our system is so fast. So now that we have our system up and running, we are about six months into our training, um, and we are training on English, and we are getting some decent results in English. Uh, at this point of time, we decided to um, think about, OK, so we started out with a premise of deep learning being a very flexible approach. How flexible is it? Can we train on a different language without doing anything? Can one network do network architecture do two different languages? And let's make our lives even a little bit hard. We'll train on English and on Mandarin. Now, English and Mandarin, as you know, even if you don't speak Mandarin, are very different languages that I started off with. One is tonal, another is not. One has 26 characters, another has, I think, 80,000 or something like that. Um, we use the 6,000 most frequent characters. Um, and it turns out the answer is yes. I mean, it, this still boggles my mind that you have one network architecture that does two languages really, really well. And a funny story from when we started uh, doing Mandarin training was uh, nobody in our team spoke Mandarin. We had large and very good Mandarin data set, but nobody could speak it. But we are, I mean, looking at the training curves, we knew that we were getting really, really good results. So this is kind of, I think, the epitome of flexibility, that you have a group of people with no experience of domain, no experience of languages. Just by the power of data and the power of deep learning, we are training these networks for two, two different languages. Um, so let's look at how does training differ? I mean, how different are these net, uh, network architectures? And it turns out they're not different at all. It's the same network architecture that I showed you a couple of slides back of these three convolution networks and seven record neural networks works for both languages. The only difference is the output layer, which is the uh, fully connected layer that's outputting the probability distribution. Instead of doing on 29 characters, which 26 characters for some punctuation symbols, uh, now does it of over 6,000 characters. That's all the difference there is. And we have a language model at the end, and the language model, of course, has to be language specific, so we have a language model for Mandarin. So now we have, now we are a year down the line, we are training both on Mandarin, we're training on Eng both Mandarin and English, um, how are we doing? How are these networks doing on our various test sets that we have? Um, so let's start with English. So how do we fare on English? So you know, just like machine any other uh, machine learning algorithm, deep learning is only as good um, as our data. So our data for English is very skewed towards the US accent. Um, so we do really well, I mean, at, at human level for little bit, like not a lot of noise, um, clean US accented data. Um, and in, at this point, we realize that English you know, is a kind of a funny language. There are a billion English speakers on the planet. Out of a billion English speakers, only 300 English speakers speak English as a first language. I mean, English is not my first language. Um, and even that, in that 300 million speakers, you have quite a bit of difference in accents, like a Scottish accent, an American accent. And if you take the 600 million speakers who speak as a second language, their accents are heavily biased by what is their native language. Um, if you go to India, this accent essentially changes from state to state. So it's very hard to come up with a very orthogonal data set for English. So we are still trying. So we don't do so well um, on ac accented speech. I mean, Indian accent is one of our uh, accents that we don't do very well on, and we're trying to get more data. We also don't do well if we haven't captured the noisy environment in which the speaker was speaking in. So those are the places where we don't do so well. So let's see how do we do on Mandarin. So in Mandarin, we have, thanks to being a Chinese company and we have done speech before and of using a traditional pipeline, uh, we have fantastic data set. Uh, it captures real world queries coming into our system, people from different accents, from different noisy backgrounds. Um, and because of this, our ASR system actually outperforms humans in short queries. So by short queries, I mean something that you would speak uh, to Google now, something that's about 15 to 20 seconds 
long. And the reason uh, we are able to do this is because human beings actually rely on a lot of context to figure out what the other person is say saying. Like if you're a noisy party, even you and I are talking, even if I don't hear everything of what you're saying, I kind of know what you're saying because I know the context. Um, but on short queries, if you don't give me any context, I'll actually do very, very poorly. Uh, this is where uh, machines outperform us. Um, so now that we have these models, uh, we finally have to do something with them. We have to let somebody use these models. So then comes the question of how do you deploy these models? And now this is also kind of challenging because these models are very, very big. I mean, uh, back in December, our models were 100 million parameters. Um, and it's gone, I mean, I, I can't give you the exact numbers now, but it's a couple of multiples of 100 million right now. So 100 million is kind of our unit. Uh, that is a uh, lot of compute. So we need a lot of compute for deployment. So at this point of time, you might say, well, I mean, why don't you use GPUs? I mean, you have been using GPUs in your training system. Don't they work for deployment? Yes and no, uh, because in deployment, what happens is users really, really care about latency, which means if you are using an app, you want the response back from the app as quickly as possible. Nobody has any patience. Now, the problem with GPUs is they are not meant for this kind of a workload. So think about a single user query that's coming into our system, which is a vector, and a neural network is basically a bunch of matrices. So you're doing a lot of matrix vector multiplies. GPUs are not set up to do this very well. GPUs love matrix matrix multiplies. The bigger the matrix are better. Um, but they're not good at uh, matrix vector multiplies. So we had to come up with um, the system of batch dispatch, which is a very, very efficient batching and dispatching me mechanism. Uh, what it does is it takes in a lot of user queries that are coming into our system and then smartly picks a batch that is both kind of efficient for the GPU and which also um, is, respects the latency constraints that we have. Uh, and I should also say that the GPUs that we use for deployment are a little bit different from the GPUs that we use for training. They, are, they don't need as large of a matrix to be computationally efficient as the, as the GPUs that we use for training. So it's again that hardware software co-design that we did uh, to make it efficient for deployment. So now that we have, you know, we have checked our boxes, right? We have developed these models, they're state of the art, we are ready for deployment. Uh, what do we do? Well, we deploy. So we have a lot of products that use voice inside of China. They're used by hundreds of millions of people. Um, and we are in the process of deploying these models to our users in China. And that is how we spent a year and a half affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of people with a small group of pe people out here in the US. And this is just not our story. This is kind of the story of deep learning too. Um, time and again, we have seen fields where deep learning has come in. There has been a lot of data and by being, having the ability to train on this large amount of data, you have gone from zero to like the state of the art uh, performance, beating humans in relatively short period of time. You've seen that in image classification, you've seen that in speech recognition, you're starting to see some very, very interesting results coming out of image captioning, where you take an image, you describe what the image is saying. So it, I mean, it's almost indistinguishable from what a human would do. Or even story generation, like, computers writing stories through recurrent neural nets. Um, it is very, very exciting. So um, I personally can't wait to see how deep learning is going to affect our lives um, in the next decade or so. I mean, we are just starting this journey. The data is going to increase. Our computational efficiency is going to increase. We are going to have more compute. So it's gonna, it's, we live in very, very exciting times. Um, so thank you for giving uh, me this opportunity. Thank you for your patience, because this was very, very last moment for me. Um, and hopefully the talk was interesting for you because uh, the subject changed a little bit as well. Um, and I'm happy to um, take any questions now or later. My email's on there. Reach out to me. I'd, I'd be very, very happy to talk. Thank you. So the question is, how do we handle homophones, which is you have um, different characters which sound very much the same. So we capture the context through the, um, the recurrent neural net basically captures the context. So 
Yeah, so that, so that context is good enough for us. Uh, typically, I would say this. I mean, after you know, a year and a half of training both languages, uh, I would say people who invented Chinese invented it for deep learning. It is, this language is really suited for deep learning. English is not. Uh, English is harder. I wouldn't say English is not. English is actually harder. Uh, to do deep learning uh, on than what Chinese is. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is because if you go into the depths of CTC, um, CTC has this conditional independence assumption, which means characters become conditionally independent after a couple of characters. So, it, you know, uh, so this causes problems in nose. So is nose K-N-O-W-S or N-O-S-E? When you are at O and you're conditionally independent on anything beyond N, you don't know. Um, in Chinese, because Chinese is so much more compact, because the characters encode so much information, this conditional independence actually holds. It, it, it doesn't hold so much in English. So it's, yeah. So because the English characters don't encode that much information, it is actually more challenging. Uh, so I, I mean, a lot of our training tricks, I, I don't know if you were in Sanjeev's talk before, um, there's this trick called Sortograd, um, which I had come up with. Uh, and and sort of grad, the idea came from actually looking at Chinese, because the Chinese utterances are much much smaller, and our Chinese training is much much more stable than English training. And then we figured out that wait a minute, we could just do this thing where we in English and for Chinese we'll present the shorter queries first, and and voila, the training was much more stable. So tra training two networks has been I don't speak Mandarin at all, but you know you look at these networks and you figure out you look at the training curves you kind of get a sense of where things are going. Yeah, I one more yeah, I have a question. I have some, I'm a PhD in speech biometrics, so I wonder what uh, do you think might be uh, a next breakthrough in uh, the quality, the efficiency of the system? Maybe you would want to use some additional features, not just uh, the spectrum, maybe something else. Uh, and by system, so, so the, by system you mean the training system or the system in general? No, no, the, the way you train the system. Oh, the way we train the system. Yeah, so, maybe so the one that we want, so the question is what, what are the next steps for the system? And we talk, we're talking about it because we're kind of brainstorming where the next place to go is. Um, one thing that we want to do is there is obviously a lot more unlabeled data than there is labeled data. Um, can we use the unlabeled data somehow? Um, so that's what we are trying to figure out. And also this problem with CTC that I talked about, which is this conditional independence assumption. Um, can we do with a different cost function, which doesn't have a different kind of network um, that doesn't have to use CTC? So those are the kind of main directions that we're looking at. Is, is there any way to gain intelligence from unlabeled data, especially for English? Because we have this accent challenge, right? Um, it's, it's almost impossible to create an English data set that encompasses the diversity of accents in English. The Britishers were great conquerors. They conquered all over the world. <laughs> so there, we have such a diversity. Uh, this ton of unlabeled data, though. The unlabeled data probably is 100 times more than we have labeled data for. Is there any way we can learn features like accents from unlabeled data? It's a very, very open research problem. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you have a question. Uh, just a quick one. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not super familiar, but I read about these uh, sort of recursive neural networks. You mentioned a couple of months before. And you were touching on like how the, you've learned a bit about Mandarin, about Chinese, and the structure of it just from yeah, 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 the conditional independence we knew because we knew the map. I mean, we have seen what, what it does, but we didn't. So the question is, um, what was your question? <laughs> I kind of interrupted, I guess. Uh, have, you, it's, have you seen anything? Uh, have you kind of learned a bit about the structure of Mandarin, even though you don't speak it, from? The only structure I learned is um, uh, Mandarin utterances are short and they're short because each character encodes so much information. And the funny thing is when we started, people said, you guys are idiots, right? Man you, are, you guys are not even doing explicit, phony model, uh, explicit tone modeling. Uh, this thing is never going to work. Uh, it turns out we never have to worry about tone at all. We, worry have to, we don't have to worry about homophones at all. 
because, the, because of the data set. The data set is really, really good. Uh, the, the network will learn those stuff. Um, so other than noticing that the utterances are small leads to stable networks, and the fact that because the characters are so information dense that the, uh, the conditional independence works really well, the assumption works really well, uh, that's kind of what we have learned from Mandarin, like just by looking at training. I mean, you know, a lot of deep learning is getting the sixth sense from doing a lot of training. Uh, Yeah, so what is the structure of RNNs they're using? Very, very good question. Um, bidirectional RNNs will usually outperform forward directional RNNs because they're usually going in a, t in a time machine, right? But think about deployment. Right. In the real time, it's much exactly. So uh, we did it for a year and we started, so obviously our deployment efforts started eh, about eight months after we started training and we started to deploy and we were like, crap. Now what do we do? <laughs> because if you have a bidirectional network and you want to deploy, you have to wait for the user to finish. And the user might talk for a long time. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, so we have now moved away from bidirectional networks. So uh, we are just working with forward directional networks now. But we, what we do use the bidirectional networks for is finding out what is the best we can do. So that kind of sets the bar. And we try to meet the bar with forward directional networks. So we are, like the models that we are deploying are forward directional networks, yes. Yeah, so we, we did that kind of stuff. To, when we were starting to deploy bidirectional, we were doing those kind of like trickery that you wait and then decode and you wait and you decode later so in the year, like buff. Kind of a headache. I mean, we want like simple stuff. So if you can get away with forward directional model, like like doing this, um, there's a lot of hand tuning involved to like having this buffering right, just right, so the latency works out. I mean, uh, ideally we would not want to do this. So it makes the, the the deployment system like too complicated. So if we can get away with forward directional models, that's what we want to do, and that's what we are trying to do. And right now, I would say. Um, uh, I can talk about what the best forward direction models are because we haven't published. We usually publish end of the year. Um, but let's say that our forward directional models now are all, all, like at par with bidirectional models. Yeah. Can you comment on what's your accuracy? Um, gosh. Uh, I don't know what's in the paper, but uh, it, I would say um, it's, in, it's in low single digits. Like, uh, sorry, the, the error, rate, error rate is in, yeah. So it's a very high 90s is our accuracy. And for Chinese, it's like, it's very, very high. So for humans, uh, accuracy rate is 95, 96%. That's for humans. So for Mandarin, we beat it. So we're higher than that. Uh, English depends on the accent and the, uh, as I said, on, on the noise. Yeah. We did it for the first paper. Benchmarking against um, APIs is actually really hard. A lot of APIs make it really, really hard to do it. So I think we had this funky thing. We had to wire the microphone to the speaker or something like that um, to do it. And then when we did it for the first paper, the Deep Speech version one, uh, people, like not, not uh, Siri particularly, I won't name the company, but a company X complained saying that, oh, you benchmarked against us. We have a better system in-house. Um, and then we said, you know, why get into this political fight? I mean, we, we're just going to say, this is what we did on, our, on, on these data sets. And um, if somebody else has a better number, they can publish, and rather than explicitly trying to benchmark it. Yeah. So, Shilpi, you talked specifically about kind of uh, latency thresholds you constrain yourself. I don't, I forget these numbers. Let me not give you the number, because I, I probably give you a wrong number, and uh, I'll be publicly vilified for it. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't worked on the production system much. I've, I mainly built the training system. Um, so I don't have the number. But um, it is what is required to make it natural for like Google or, or Baidu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, two questions. Sure. One, one kind of wild and one more obvious. The wild one is, is uh, do you or anybody you're aware of uh, try to add uh, lip reading, or maybe do lip reading on its own. But uh, it, I mean, humans are better at listening to the language in the bar because we look. And we also have, we also look at our eyes. Yes. Ah. So face face lip yeah. reading. And, and, and I, I'll ask the second question. And, and it seems that 
the issues, say, with English and accents are because you are trying to have a universal model. Well, if you know you're going to listen to an East European accent, you kind of twist your ears one way. If you know you're going to listen to Indian accent, it's the other way. Chinese, the other way. So having a short reading sample from the person on top of all the learning done in general should help. Yeah, so the first question is, of course, um, looking at orthogonal um, features like um, eyes or lips and stuff. Uh, we haven't done it. I'm not aware of the research. Very interesting question. Um, as we reach what I call the, the theoretical limits of these models, we would probably look at that kind of data. Um, it's a little bit challenging for us to use data in the US because uh, I don't think you can use YouTube data without Google's permission. And that is the largest set of video data. Um, a Chinese, we have, we have a website called iQiyi, which is the equivalent of um, YouTube um, in China, uh, so we can do it. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, um, but yeah, again, we probably will have to do it at some point. Uh, the second, I forget the second question. The second question was training on um, um, whether we can train on um, data sets of different accent and use that as a way to. Not, not train, just complete slight modification. It doesn't take too much to detect the accent, and then you can move into the portion. Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't tried it. We are, we are, accent is something that bothers us quite a bit. I mean, bothers us in the sense that, that with the fact that we are not good at. Uh, we're thinking about it. We haven't done anything on it. Uh, hopefully this year we are, that, I mean, it is one of our main focuses this year is to actually figure out a way to solve this. It seems that universality should not be aimed at. Why, why, why do you want to try? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a very good, like this is for us an unknown question. Yeah, we have, we have we have we have a lot more research to do. Uh, surprisingly, no uh, no questions on the systems. So. <laughs> um, thank you.